That's a big stage. Uh, thanks so much for uh, showing up. Uh, my uh, special uh, thanks is to uh, MakerDAO fam, obviously. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, bridges. Uh, you might have heard a lot of talks about bridges. Uh, this one might be slightly different uh, because um, the subject of the talk is actually quite serious. I mean, we had a lot of problems with bridges recently. So um, before I actually go into the, um, the crux of the matter, let's, uh, let's just go back uh, <coughs> uh, and look at a bit of a history. So uh, how come I'm here? Um, two years ago, more or less, we started to work at the uh, um, multi-chain strategy for the MakerDAO, and we asked ourselves a question, how do we actually move DAI to different chains? So um, it was actually quite, quite hard, and, uh, and for us, let, let me go back. Uh, so two years ago, we started to work on the multi-chain strategy. And uh, we had to look at all the other chains, and we had to find out how secure they are to actually be able to move DAI uh, in a very secure manner. And uh, to do I that, to, to look at the uh, uh, security of all the other chains. So uh, basically, uh, I created the spreadsheet, and I posted the spreadsheet on the forum. And Frankly, after a while, uh, not a lot of people uh, looked at the data and looked at uh, what we had to say. So, so I figured that we need to make this information uh, more broadly available to the broader audience. And uh, we uh, basically uh, created a website called L2Beat. And the reason uh, for us to actually do that was to make people aware that the security of DAI on all the other chains uh, is very, very different. If you hold DAI on, let's say, Polygon, if you hold DAI on Phantom, uh, you'll be looking at a very, very different DAI. And the security properties of the DAI will be very different. Um, for MakerDAO, um, it is of the utmost importance uh, that DAI is censorship resistance. And if you hold DAI on all these other chains, you should really ask yourself a question. Is this really a DAI that uh, you hold on Ethereum? Uh, does it have the same properties, or uh, is it actually different, right? And uh, can you make all these different DAIs fungible? And what is, uh, what is it really needed to be able to mint DAI on all these other chains? So these are actually quite hard questions, and that's why it took us uh, so long to get all of us to where we are here. And... Um, once we looked at all the other chains, we want to publish all the results. And this is how L2Beat was born. L2Beat was uh, essentially initially created uh, as a website to disclose all the risks for all the different chains. Um, and it took us really by surprise how important this uh, uh, thing was. Everyone was like really looking uh, at, at the risks and the value locked and uh, at all the information that we actually uh, uncovered, in a way. So let's have a very quick look at the state of the bridges and where we are uh, today. So essentially, uh, when we look back at the last year, uh, it was a bad year, right? Uh, we had a hack at the Poly Network, we had a hack at the chain swap, uh, we had a hack at the uh, um, AnySwap, so uh, last year was really, really bad, but that doesn't really compare to uh, what we witnessed this year. Uh, and it's really shaping up to be much, much worse. So it all started with the wormhole hack, uh, then we had a run-in network, um, it was like huge, uh, $600 million uh, was taken uh, from that bridge. Uh, then we had the Harmony uh, Nomad. Uh, this one was particularly bad. Uh, I personally really liked Nomad architecture. I was actually uh, trying to convince uh, my uh, peers at Maker to have a very closer, uh, much closer look. And unfortunately, to a bug in a smart contract, uh, it was uh, hacked uh, literally two weeks after I pitched uh, Nomad. So um, that, was, that was really, really... Uh, 
intense. And, and then uh, probably a week uh, before DEF CON, uh, you might have heard about Binance. And I even had to uh, correct my presentation uh, because of what happened literally yesterday, right? And it's not just the bridge. Uh, some other DeFi protocols were hacked as well, but uh, yet we had another uh, bridge hack. So bridges are scary, and bridges uh, seem to be really a uh, weak point in all of this, and we had to take a closer look at all of them. Uh, so far, we spent um, the last two years looking mostly at the roll-ups, and now um, it was time for our team uh, to have a look at the other bridges as well. And how uh, we published this information, like I said before, uh, we uh, basically looked at all the escrows, we looked at all the values uh, that was uh, locked in all the bridges. Um, but looking at other, not just the roll-ups, looking at other bridges uh, was essentially requested by the community. And if Josh Stark from Ethereum Foundation asks you to actually do something, you should certainly consider. So, uh, without the further ado, I mean, this is uh, actually my pleasure to, uh, to announce that at L2Beat, uh, we also are covering all the bridges. Uh, you can check it out. Uh, it's actually uh, up and running and live uh, since yesterday. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, how we look at these bridges and uh, what are the funding, uh, findings uh, that we uh, uncovered uh, by, by looking at these bridges. So. Um, to put it simply, uh, we obviously track uh, total value locked uh, in these bridges. Uh, so we can see uh, more or less the same uh, type of list as for layer twos. Uh, we uh, track total value locked and uh, you, can, you can see how much uh, value is at stake. Uh, this is all that value that uh, potentially can be hacked and the bridges are like these uh, huge uh, pinatas. Uh, for, uh, for potential hackers, right? So we really need to understand what are the risks and what are the security assumptions behind all these bridges. Uh, and then uh, you can look at the bridges to rollups uh, as a type of a canonical bridge. Uh, so you can combine uh, this information and, uh, and you can see the total value uh, logged in uh, uh, all of these systems and all of these bridges. Uh, but as you know, uh, L2Beat is uh, primarily about the, uh, the risks. We want to disclose the risks. Uh, like you can see on this uh, particular example, uh, um, most of you probably know that uh, Optimism uh, does not have fraud proofs uh, uh, right now deployed. Uh, and this information uh, should be known and available to everybody. Uh, so you know when you move your funds uh, to Optimism, uh, what are the security assumptions. I mean, we are in a close contact with Optimism team. We know that they're working on the fraud proof system. Uh, uh, but as it stands right now, you have to trust them, right? You have to trust the team and you have to trust the sequencer. Um, so I guess we thought that, you know, we need a proper uh, risk framework for bridges. Uh, that would work more or less the same way as we did that before for uh, rollups. We believe that uh, risks uh, should be disclosed. We believe that uh, we should make everybody aware uh, of the underlying security assumptions. Uh, we should constantly monitor infrastructure for upgrades and uh, we should really monitor the other uh, security uh, parameters. And, and this is tough. Uh, this is hard because uh, some of uh, these constructs are actually quite, quite complex and uh, you need proper automation, you need proper tooling, uh, you actually need to be able to read from uh, storage diffs, uh, which if you have ever tried to do that, uh, it's not particularly easy, and uh, thankfully uh, right now there are some tools that actually allow you to uh, do it uh, much easier, but generally uh, what you need to do uh, is you need to replay all the potential Ethereum transactions uh, that uh, change the particular slot. So, so that's tough, um, but, uh, but this is our task, and we uh, believe that once we do that, we'll actually make multi-chain infrastructure more transparent and secure uh, while uh, keeping uh, teams uh, honest. 
And it is all about honesty, right? It is all about proper disclosures. Uh, it is all about uh, making sure that uh, users do understand the risks. So what are the risks when you're actually using bridges? And you would be surprised how a few people actually do understand. Uh, most people kind of think that uh, when funds are in transit uh, and once they arrive to the destination, they should be safe, right? So it's almost like, you know, crossing the, uh, the bridge across the water and and once you made it to the other side, you know, you're safe. But you're not. You're definitely not safe, and uh, I will try to explain why. Uh, but before I do that, you know, I will actually uh, uh, show you a few uh, interesting findings uh, that you might actually also find surprising. So, so the first one, and I think it's actually quite a big one, uh, is the, uh, uh, the multi-chain. Uh, multi-chain is one of the biggest bridges with the uh, biggest TVL. Uh, turns out that last year uh, they actually removed from escrow uh, quite a lot of funds, like uh, literally millions of dollars. So normally uh, for that type of uh, bridge you expect that you put uh, your funds into escrow and on the other side of the bridge some funds will be minted, right? Uh, and when you go back, uh, the funds from the destination, they will be burned and the validators will release the funds from the escrow. Uh, turns out that, you know, in this particular case, uh, validators actually took funds out of the escrow without actually burning them uh, from the destination. So that was odd and the, the amount was very uh, significant um, and it seems like no one cared. Like, people were not really aware that that was happening, and just the fact that it is possible for the validators uh, to take funds out of the escrow, uh, this is the risk assumption that, you know, you should be all aware of, right? If you're using the bridge that's externally validated, that's the thing, you know, they can all take your funds. So in this particular instance, apparently the funds were used to provide liquidity uh, to any tokens on, on a lot of different chains, and to make sure that this is exactly what happened, you would have to like go to all the other chains and check it out. But you know, my question to uh, to the multi-chain team is: uh, Was this part of the contract? Right? Uh, were users aware? And what is the consequence? Uh, can actually users withdraw all their funds? Uh, and more importantly. Uh, what is this additional uh, trust assumption? Uh, because if the validators can remove funds from the escrow, uh, they can do all sorts of things as well, right? And how do you actually monitor uh, what they're doing? So that's one. Uh, then you have uh, something that called Plasma Bridge. Uh, some of you, again, uh, might be aware of because this is uh, one of the two bridges uh, that you normally use to move tokens to Polygon. And uh, this particular one uh, has a very interesting documentation. It says in the documentation that it uh, provides increased security guarantees because there's a seven day withdrawal period. And during that period, you can challenge uh, um, validators from Polygon. So it's kind of like a plasma um, exit mechanism. Uh, however, uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, this was actually implemented and deployed on a testnet, but it was never deployed on the mainnet, right? So if you look at the mainnet code, and by the way, who's looking at the mainnet code of the bridge, you know, of the contract? Probably very, very few of you. Um, you'll see that uh, the method that allows you to actually challenge the validators is empty, right? You can't do that. Uh, so frankly, the Plasma bridge right now um, has the same security assumptions as the POS bridge, the main bridge that you normally use to the polygon, and uh, it's got this user uh, nuisance uh, of seven day withdrawal period. And the last one that I wanted to mention, uh, which uh, in the documentation, uh, the risks were properly disclosed, but again, I think that the user should be aware of uh, that uh, if you use the Omni bridge uh, to move your funds to the XDAI chain, uh, they might invest some of these funds. They might actually put the funds that you normally expect to be in the escrow uh, into Aave, into Compound, or wherever they like, actually, right? So normally it's called uh, rehypothecation. Uh, this is the practice where you know, banks are using your funds to actually invest them, and you're running into liquidity risk, potentially. If you were to withdraw all the funds, it, uh, they may not be available. They might be like locked somewhere uh, in, 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 say, Ava or, or whatnot, right? So the whole process is very transparent, but the power of validators to actually do that uh, may be surprising to some of you. Uh, because again, it's a question, uh, what are the security assumptions, right? And what do you normally expect when you put the funds uh, into the bridge? 
So, uh, so now with all these examples, you may wonder, you know, how do you actually collate all this information and how do you actually make it available to the users? And this is a challenge. Uh, we've got hundreds of bridges, we've got hundreds of different destinations, we've got hundreds of tokens, and uh, every single transfer may be actually different, right? And this is a challenge for us as well, because we really wanted to make it very transparent to everybody, and we wanted to make sure that users are actually aware uh, what exactly is happening behind the scenes. So, so we tried to kind of, you know, make it the whole framework user-friendly, and I will quickly uh, summarize uh, what you will be seeing uh, on the uh, L2 uh, Beat uh, Bridges section. So, first of all, we kind of differentiate primarily two different uh, bridge types. And the first one is a token bridge, and that's the bridge that means tokens on the destination. Uh, and then, uh, so this is something that, you know, normally you should be like, uh, intuitively expecting, right? You put tokens into the escrow, the, the bridge mints tokens on the destination. Uh, however, a lot of bridges cannot mint tokens, right? Like, take DAI as an example. I mean, most bridges won't have uh, access to uh, DAI minting facilities, so they have to do something different. Uh, they have to, on the destination, they have to create a liquidity pool. Uh, they have to mint something, or maybe, you know, through some other mechanism, and they will, like, swap whatever they minted for the DAI uh, that is like sitting and waiting for you on the destination. And we call these types of bridges liquidity networks. And I think what is the most confusing for end users is that if you go to a UI of almost any bridge, uh, you will not know if you're actually using token bridge or a liquidity network. In fact, uh, some of the bridges are hybrid. Sometimes, for some tokens, they may actually mint you tokens. Sometimes they may use uh, liquidity pools. And it, like as is the case for the multi-chain, uh, you can have like some mixed results. Some of the tokens may be minted for you, and some of the tokens may be actually uh, coming from the liquidity pool. So uh, these types of bridges we will call a uh, hybrid. Uh, and again, if you compare token bridges to liquidity networks, they have a very different risk profiles. Um, so for the end users, I think it's very useful uh, to actually understand uh, the difference uh, between the two, right? You have uh, unlimited liquidity for the token bridge. Uh, you have tokens uh, um, that if you keep the token at the destination, you will face the risk of the validators of that bridge. Uh, and generally, token bridges can be quite slow and expensive while the liquidity network is almost like the opposite, right? Uh, it has uh, limited liquidity typically, so you may end up with your tokens being stuck. Uh, uh, but tokens held on a destination are not at risk of this network. They're actually at risk of the token bridge that was used initially uh, to move tokens to the liquidity pool. Uh, so again, uh, this is the risk that is actually quite difficult to uh, disclose. And uh, finally, uh, they can be fast and they can be cheap, right? Um, so, so this is the, uh, the column uh, on the L2Beat, uh, which you can check uh, very quickly. And, and this is something that uh, should be uh, essentially easy to read uh, for all of you. Uh, and if you use any particular type of a bridge, you know, I do encourage you to check it out and, 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 and understand the consequences. Uh, more importantly, from the risk perspective, uh, and this is like maybe a little bit more technical, uh, uh, is the question how the messages are actually relayed between the source chain and the destination chain. So technically, we use all sorts of uh, terms for this, like arbitrary messaging bridge or uh, some other terminology. Um, but because we wanted to make the framework uh, sort of user-friendly, uh, we just want you to understand what are the four in our opinion, primary mechanisms that are actually used uh, to relay the messages. And again, uh, these messages are important because when you lock your token uh, at the source, the destination somehow has to be informed uh, how do you mean the token at the destination, right? So what are the four different uh, categories? Well, first of all, you've got the third party, uh, meaning that you have to trust someone to relay this message, and that particular party can essentially break you, right? So you, you, you put full trust on that party. Uh, then uh, you've got what we call the uh, uh, optimistic scheme. We relay the message, uh, we trust that the message is correct, 
uh, unless someone actually proves that the message is incorrect. So your intuition should be like, who's watching uh, the relayers, right? Who are the watchers and uh, what is the length of the, uh, of the fraud proof window? Uh, because optimistic uh, message bridges, uh, they always have watchers and they always have the uh, uh, fruit, uh, fraud proof window. Uh, then uh, we've got bridges that we normally call uh, as uh, secured by light clients. And essentially what it means is that we trust the destination chain to tell us what happened, right? So when, uh, let's say, Polygon validators say that something happened on Polygon, I don't check that this is exactly what happens, I just trust the Polygon validators. Uh, and on Ethereum, I just need to uh, build uh, software that will uh, check the signatures, essentially, right? Uh, so you're putting your trust on the validators on the destination chain. And the most secure bridges, in our opinion, uh, are the trustless bridges uh, that uh, use Ethereum as the ultimate source of truth. So we don't trust anybody. Uh, we build smart contracts on Ethereum that will validate if the uh, destination chain is not lying to us. Uh, obviously, there are two techniques right now. Uh, you can use ZK proofs uh, or you can use uh, uh, fraud proofs. Uh, that's why we've got ZK rollups and optimistic rollups. And if implemented correctly, uh, these are by far uh, the most secure uh, bridges. Uh, provided that uh, there are no bugs uh, in the implementation, right? So, uh, what can go wrong? I mean, if you've got external validators, everything can go wrong, right? Uh, they've got full access to the escrow, they can mint whatever they want to mint. If there's a bug, you know, uh, you can have uh, billions of tokens minted out of thin air, and uh, validators can censor, they can steal, they can freeze funds, they can do whatever, right? You have to fully trust validators. Uh, for optimistic validation, um, as I said before, you need to make sure that watchers are actually active because if no one's watching, uh, the fraudulent message can be uh, relayed. Uh, for the light client validation, uh, if you're transferring your tokens to a chain that's weak, uh, that has very, uh, I don't know, uh, it's a low value chain and um, validators can be potentially 51% attacked, uh, then your tokens again can be stolen from escrow. So you have to really understand how strong is the chain that you're moving your tokens to. And finally, uh, for rollups, for full client Ethereum validation, in theory, uh, nothing can go wrong, right? Uh, so funds cannot be censored, uh, funds cannot be stolen, as long as there are no bugs in the implementation. Uh, and this is the, uh, how we actually show uh, who is validating all these bridges. And I think this is the most important column that you should all uh, focus if you want to understand uh, how a particular bridge uh, operates. Then we have the upgradability. Uh, so, so this is essentially the information whether the bridge can be upgraded and who have got the upgrade power. Uh, and again, uh, we kind of have to assume that uh, whoever's got this power is honest. Uh, so this is a very important security assumption. If you can upgrade the bridge, you can steal all the funds. That's as simple as that. Uh, and finally, and I think this is the most interesting aspect, which is often overlooked, uh, is uh, who's got the minting power on the destination, right? So take again DAI as an example. Uh, if you move uh, DAI uh, via three different bridges, uh, let's say uh, you use the uh, uh, Make a DAO bridge uh, and move your DAI to Arbitrum Optimus Starknet, uh, your DAI will be essentially minted by Make a DAO contracts, right? Uh, and it will have uh, exactly the same properties as your DAI on the uh, mainnet. But if you move DAI through the Polygon bridge, then your DAI on Polygon will be minted by Polygon validators, and they might actually have the upgrade power of the DAI. And finally, if you move DAI on Phantom, it will be minted uh, by multi-chain, uh, multi-seek. Right? So again, uh, it's a question to you, I mean, how secure you feel with your DAI in your wallet. Uh, so this is the last column uh, that we show on our framework. And as I said before, uh, I guess, you know, the, the, the end game for all of us uh, should be to build trustless bridges. Um, because everything else, uh, we need to put our trust on some, uh, some other parties. Uh, and these bridges are very, very hard to build. 
We had uh, some uh, problems with uh, Arbitrum Bridge. Uh, there was a bug, it was uh, essentially, uh, fortunately, uh, uh, uncovered and the bridge wasn't hacked, but, uh, but as you can see, you know, uh, the roll-up bridges can be buggy. Uh, same situation happened in Optimism, um, and this is one of the reasons why uh, these bridges are right now not fully uh, yet permissionless, and I hope they will be uh, very, very soon. But even more importantly, as you can see from this transaction, uh, that's actually moving, uh, how much is it? Uh, this is actually seven, uh, over 700,000 Ether uh, from one version of the bridge to another version of a bridge, and that power has uh, Arbitrum multi-seek, right? So even though you may think that Arbitrum has fraud proofs and whatnot, uh, they still have a multi-seek that can move all the funds from the bridge, and they did in this very transaction, and it doesn't really raise any alarm. So that was kind of uh, interesting. Um, we, uh, we saw this transaction and, you know, we analyzed this transaction. It was an upgrade and everyone knew that Arbitrum uh, was about to upgrade, but uh, seeing such a transaction moving essentially uh, billions of funds in one, one move, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of scary. So uh, to sum up, uh, we uh, kind of think that uh, we have no choice. Uh, we have to put engineering effort into uh, building those uh, roll-up bridges. I don't think it makes a lot of sense uh, moving forward to rely on, on, on third parties uh, in the long term. In the short term, they might be quite useful because we need that functionality, but in the long term, eventually we need to find a way to actually make sure that uh, the code uh, behind all these uh, roll-ups uh, is actually secure. And as I said before, I mean, uh, the code is very, very complex, right? Uh, these bridges are actually very hard to analyze. Um, I guess uh, for a while, none of these roll-ups uh, the, uh, have shed uh, the training wheels. Uh, so uh, so you, you should really also understand uh, what are the current uh, assumptions. Uh, but every single team that we talked to, uh, they have promised us that eventually uh, these training wheels uh, will be shed. Uh, so there's, there's some hope for the future. But how do we make sure that such complex software is bug-free? And how do we make sure uh, that uh, these rollups uh, will not be uh, hacked in the uh, ensuing months. And I think this is probably one of the hardest questions uh, from the engineering perspective and from the perspective of the whole community. Uh, we don't uh, seem to have a solution for dealing with uh, uh, discovery of potentially critical bugs without actually relying on some honest actor, right? Uh, if the bug is found, uh, we all want some good guys to shut down the bridge, uh, fix the bug, and restart the bridge uh, without the bug. That's quite obvious, right? No one wants really the bridge to be, uh, to be drained by, uh, by malicious actor. Uh, however, right now it just seems that the best we can do is to sort of create a multisig uh, of some uh, trusted uh, uh, security engineers, I guess, or a security council of sorts, and uh, these guys can uh, perform uh, these sudden upgrades. And uh, to make it permissionless and to make it immutable, uh, that also means that uh, we are exposed to uh, potential problems. So, uh, so thank you so much uh, for listening, and uh, I, I do hope that you know the future is bright and and hack free.